This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us today for long table number 119. We made it. Uh, we'll keep going after this. So thank you for joining us again. Uh, I would like to introduce today uh, Dr. Ragnar Hedlund, uh, who is uh, the chief curator at the Uppsala University Museum. Um, he is a research in classics and numismatics focusing on visual culture and social dynamics in the Roman Imperial Age. Uh, also participating, participating in uh, Byzantineology and studies in museums, uh, uses of history and cultural heritage. Um, so today we are actually getting something a little bit different, uh, an introduction to Swedish numismatics. So uh, please, without any further ado, uh, Dr. Hedlund, I hand it off to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, and uh, uh, thank you so much for the for the invitation. Uh, I hope that you can hear me all right. Um, I'm joining you from 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 Sweden, from Uppsala in Sweden, where it's actually Friday evening. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you never really can tell um, what, what the uh, connections would be like. But I'm, as uh, is usually the case, and uh, uh, I'm going to start by by sharing the screen. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm, uh, today I'm not going to talk about, about Roman coins or uh, or uh, about or about anything anything um, uh, which is in line of my own research. But I th I thought that um, talking a little bit about about Swedish numismatics would be a way to pre present something that you that you would, maybe would not be so familiar with. Uh, so I'm going to so this will be a brief. Uh, Crash course, as, as it were, in in Swedish numismatic history, and there'll be a, a few examples from the collections of Uppsala University. So now let's have let's have the uh, presentation. So here we, here we go. Uh, I hope you can see it all. Um, I, I hope you see that for uh, the first slide yes. with, with, with the title of the presentation. Um, yes, so so then we, so then we'll, let's let's begin. Um, coin coin collections, and as we, as, as so we I suppose we all know, is frequently considered to have started with Francesco Petrarca, frequently characterized as the first Renaissance man. Uh, notably, was he was also one of the first coin dealers, as, as is well known. And uh, in a letter of 1355, Petrarca recounts a diplomatic uh, mission to Mantua, in which he encountered the Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV. And the emperor uh, expressed an interest in Petrarca's compendium of ancient history on famous men. But instead, Petrarca presented the emperor with some coins depicting ancient Roman emperors. With the, with the words, behold, Caesar, those you have succeeded. Behold, those you should strive to imitate and admire. And this anecdote provides us with two clues to the orig origins of coin collections. First, coins are associated with nobles and cultural personalities, and coins are to be regarded as high status objects. And secondly, we can associate them with social interactions. Uh, because uh, uh, coins and even even more so metals tend to change hands, and this is the case with with the first Swedish medals as well. Now we go to the first slide, uh, with some content in it at least. Um, the, the the modern Swedish state is traditionally considered to have, have been founded by by Gustav Vasa or Gustav the First. Um, who is also known today, for, uh, for, uh, at least at least for some people, uh, to, uh, for the world's longest cross-country skiing competition, which is held here in Sweden every spring. Uh, follow and it's it's based very loosely on uh, some legend, the legendary history of of this king. Uh, and here you will also see uh, um, a late uh, an early twentieth century. Uh, the depiction, depiction of of Gustav also entering entering Stockholm and become where where he became coronated as as the king of Sweden, um, hi, highly romantic as, as you see, and that's that's also a huge painting. I think it's it measures seven, seven to fifteen meters or so, and it's in the National Museum in, in Stockholm. And here you also see what is uh, what is uh, uh, generally considered to be the first medal 
uh, struck in Sweden, and it was struck for the funeral of Gustav Vasa in 1516. And uh, this uh, object is uh, pretty typical of, of its age. Uh, it, it was uh, basically struck as, as a souvenir uh, for, for uh, VIP visitors to, to the funeral under uh, Gustav's uh, eldest son and successor, Eric, who, who became King of Sweden after, after King Gustav. And it's also quite typical of um, uh, medals in Sweden in the, in the 16th century. They basically look like these with, with, with these, these kinds of portraits. So we then, we then move on. Um, before I move on, I'd just like to draw your attention to two uh, recent titles uh, that, that I'm uh, that I'm going to be using you know, throughout this talk. And the first one is uh, uh, the, um, the title to, to the right, which, which is uh, the most uh, uh, very recent publication. Uh, it's it's uh, the second edition of the standard work for Swedish, for Swedish coinage. Um, the, the original publication came out in the 1970s, I think. And now there's a second, ed second edition that came out this, this autumn uh, called, as you see, the, the Coinage of Sweden. And uh, it, um, and as you see, there's summaries in English and German, so it uh, it should be okay for, for you to use. And um, I'm not sure whether whether um, the pu the publishers have have gotten international distri distribution yet, but it should be available online. And and if any anybody would be interested in in, in acquiring it and and I can't get it. Uh, you, you could you could just contact me, and I'll uh, and I'll get you in touch with with the publishers. And then, the sec secondly, to to the left, um, as a, re a recent um, uh, doctoral dissertation in art history from Lund University in southern Sweden, it was defended last autumn, uh, well, December last year, exactly a year ago, uh, by my colleague Ulva Heidenthaler. Um, so some of you who, who were in, in Warsaw uh, earlier this, this autumn may, may have, have heard her talk on the medals of, of Queen Christina of Sweden. And uh, this doctoral thesis uh, treats a topic which, um, curiously enough, hasn't really, hasn't really been explored, at least not yet in, not in Sweden, namely uh, how these uh, objects uh, were, were actually used. So, so, so that's also recommendable, and uh, it's also been di digitally published, uh, as, uh, so you know, it can be found and downloaded. So now we move on to Gustav's eldest son, you know, King King Eric, who's uh, who's um, uh, who is num number fourteen in the in, in the Swedish chronicles. We don't, we really don't know where where the first thirteen Eriks came from, but they were they were all more or less invented in in the late in the late Middle Ages and in the uh, early early sixteenth century. Uh, but anyway, uh, Eric Eric the Fourteenth uh, was the first of Gustav's son who ascended who who, who ascended to the throne. Uh, the 16th century in Sweden was dominated by the sons of, of Gustav Asa, and um, uh, uh, King Eric was a highly intelligent but also a tr uh, very troubled character, um, became a legendary figure in Swedish history and folklore, uh, and as far as numismatics are concerned, the most interesting object uh, is the, this object you, you see to the right, um, the so-called the so blood clipping. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, the coinage of King Eric is, is, is I would say, fairly typical uh, 16th century coinage. And uh, but but this uh, blood clipping is, is uh, sort of interesting. Um, uh, King Eric um, uh, killed two members of a rivaling uh, noble family during an attack of insanity, and he, he was then sentenced to pay a fine of silver to the widow of, of one of, of the victims. But uh, the widow refused to touch uh, the silver and cl claimed it, 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 there was blood on it, and, and instead gave the silver to Eric's two younger brothers, the du Dukes John and Charles, and, who then struck money from the silver. And so afterwards, uh, these have been popularly known as the, the blood clippings. And, and um, of, of, of course, we, we don't really know whether that happened, but uh, that, that's the popular story. And that, that's why these have been, been very popular with, with collectors. And that also means that there's lo lots of fakes uh, around. 
uh, although the, it's it's pretty easy to tell tell the fakes sort of from the genuine pieces. Uh, and here, here you also also see a, a, a much later um, you know, vignette from from the life of King Eric with with uh, Cardin Monstop, his his mistress, uh, the girl from the people, and uh, also to the right uh, the his his e evil counselor. So there's uh, lo lots of romantic stories uh, surrounding him. Um, we, we, we then come to um, arguably the most famous Swedish king, at least uh, the, the older Swedish kings, um, uh, Gustavus Adolphus, um, who be became king in the 1620s. Um, uh, uh, as uh, you may know, um, was the king who made Sweden a, a major power in Europe, at least for a few decades in the, in the middle of the 17th century. Um, he was also the main benefactor of Uppsala University. And uh, among the things he did was that he, he, provide, he provided funding for the construction of a new main, main, of a new main building for the university. Uh, it, it was uh, therefore called the Gustavianum, and that's nowadays the University Museum. And uh, Gustavus Adolphus also uh, led Sweden into the Thirty Years' War, uh, and uh, at least in the beginning, very successful, very successfully so. And he became sort of a Protestant superstar uh, during the first years uh, of the of the 1630s, and um, that also led to um, a huge variety of uh, various kinds of medals and trinkets and uh, other kinds of souvenirs. Uh, uh, struck with the uh, with, with the portrait of Gustavus Adolphus, uh, and the one you you see on on the top to the right is is a fairly, fairly typical smaller object, uh, um, and and we have we have lots of those in the in the collections, uh, and um, I think they're also from pretty common elsewhere. And these small uh, souvenirs were. Pro probably made it to be to be worn by you know the sympathizers of the Protestant cause uh, in Sweden and also elsewhere in Germany, for instance. Um, and Gustavus um, Adolphus has also been quite famous for her for uh, uh, falling in, in battle at the Battle of Lützen, uh, which was in 1632. And here, here you see him much later in the. Uh, very nationalistic, nationalistic, and very dramatic rendering of of that uh, um, fateful battle, and uh, there was also lo lots of various objects were struck uh, following his, his death in battle for various uh, um, celebrations and, and various mourning celebrations, and such as this small medal from our collections. And, um, here, here we have a few larger objects that are, that are also from, from uh, those years in the first half of the 1630s. Um, and then to the left uh, uh, is, a, is a piece of largesse money from Volgas in Germany. Uh, it's, a, it's a gold coin equivalent to four ducats. And uh, as you see, it, 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 this was made for the transport of, of the king's body from Germany to Sweden in 1633. And um, you, you see, you see this, this motif, which then also occurs on this, this huge medal, uh, provided both sides of, the, of that, because we're, we're going to take a little closer look at that. And uh, this motif was made by certain uh, Sebastian Dattler, who was, who was a German medalist. And, uh, who, who made lots of medals for Gustavus Adolphus um, during these first years of the 1630s? Uh, also made uh, quite a lot of medals uh, for others, no, no, not least not least the Polish kings. While I was in Warsaw uh, during the National Numismatic Congress, I saw uh, in, in their exhibition uh, there, was, there was they had quite a lot of medals uh, made made by Dattler for the, for the Polish kings as well. Um, but he, here you see uh, the interesting thing here, and the, the reason why I wanted to show both of, both of these is that you can actually see how uh, this motif, which then, which actually first occurs on these um, uh, gold coins struck in Germany, then as it were travels north um, through Germany and then ends up in Sweden on these huge medals struck, struck for the funeral of Gustavus Adolphus in 1634. So, so what then are, are we actually seeing on this medal? Well, on the on the on the obverse above, 
you see the dead king lying uh, lying there in, in full armor and with 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 his crown, etc. Uh, we see the sky opening above him, and you see a sky full of clouds and full of, full of small angels. And two of these angels are carrying the the dead king's soul up to towards the divine heavens. And of course, you, you see that it's the divine heavens above him because you, you see the name of God, the, the tetragrammaton, inscribed in the in, in the sun disk, uh, which which is of course one of these symbols that uh, occur on a lot of these medals. And, uh, from this age. And to the left, uh, you see this vaguely triangular uh, field uh, where, where, where the symbolism is not so easy to read. But fortunately, Dautler has provided us with, with some text showing us what we're actually seeing here. Uh, what we're seeing is, um, with some goodwill, you, you, you can possibly uh, discern a, no a number of horses. Um, what we're, what we're supposed to be seeing is uh, the Catholic army retreating from, from the battlefield of Lützen. Because, uh, of course, for the Protestant uh, side, it was, of course, uh, important to, to um, um, point out that technically Lützen was, was, a, was a Protestant victory as the, the Protestant army held the field when the, when the, when the day was over. Um, so, so that's what, what the, they're trying to show us there, e even though the, uh, it's... Um, the, de the detail is uh, not very easy to follow there. The reverse, which you can see below, is much more dramatic, or even more dramatic. Here you see the, the dead king riding in his chariot uh, and crushing the Catholic dragon on, under these heavy wheels and under the hoofs of, of the horses. Uh, you, see, you see that it's the dead king, because if you look closely enough, you'll see that uh, his left leg is, is a skeleton leg. And you also see his ribs protruding from, from, from under his clothing. Uh, and you also see that he's, he's, he's uh, coronated with, uh, with a wreath, uh, which is, of course, yet an another one of these, uh, of these uh, classical symbols that were used uh, on a lot of these images. Uh, and he's, he, he, that crown is put on his head by two persons uh, uh, symbolizing the freedom of religion to the left and fortitude to the right. So fortitude is the, is the guy to the right who's clinging onto a pillar that seems as if it's uh, going to collapse uh, any, anytime soon. And above them both the stands, et vita et mortetum, for I triumph in life as well as in death. And so so that, that, that's how, how you can create propaganda with these immensely detailed um, pictures um, in, in the 17th century. And, it, and it's also inter interesting to see how this um, motif is traveling from, from one point to another. Um, with the, we then move on to the, the, the next phase uh, in the, the development of the numismatic culture in, in Sweden. Um, as I mentioned, Gustavus Adolphus was also a key figure in the history of Uppsala University uh, because because um, uh, he, he um, donated fundings for the construction of a new university main building, and that's also the age when the uh, when a cabinet of curiosity and when the cabinet of curiosity uh, is uh, is introduced in in Swedish culture. Um, the cabinet of curiosities uh, can be regarded as an earliest as an early type of museum collections, uh, developing mainly at the courts of nobles, but also at universities. And um, of course, so this, this image is, is well known. Um, and it, it's the Museum Vormianum in Denmark. And um, in, in this early type of museum collections, uh, coins were also common. And um, this is what these collections at the courts uh, of, of coins and medals, et cetera, gradually develop into. And these collections of curiosities are, um, are sometimes described more or less as confused heaps of various objects collected uh, at, at more or less at random and just because of their strangeness. And uh, th this, as has frequently been, been pointed out, uh, is a misunderstanding. Or, and rather, the collections uh, of um, the, or these curious objects were built upon clear principles. Uh, they were reflecting an early 17th century understanding of the world and man's place in it. They were scientific collections of the early modern age, and they represented 
an attempt to contain the whole of the known world in one space. And collections of curiosities were, were therefore characterized by different combinations of objects and object categories. Uh, for instance, manuscripts, works of arts and sculptures, uh, etc., coins and the biological uh, or botanical collections. And so th these collections were designed to be a miniature of the world itself. Um, and key to the construction of the cabinet uh, is that one did not make any difference between that objects made by man and those made by nature. And they were both alike because above both stood the God, the, the supreme creator of all things. And, and that is why one will find both fabricated things and objects from nature in the collections. Uh, you, you'll, you would find artificalia, as they were, they were called in Latin, things, things made by man, and naturalia, things made by nature. And uh, those two groups were of equal importance as both man and nature had the same origins. And um, uh, th these collections were therefore an, an illustration of God's creation and a way of making symbolic links visible between that, that seen and that unseen. And um, uh, as I said, many of those collections uh, of course also contained, contained coins um, as uh, coins were, were, were uh, uh, obviously a part of the, of the world in w where man was living. And some of the most common souvenirs, uh, the coins were also some of the most su common souvenirs for any nobleman from the Renaissance and onwards. And so in, in these collections, and, and that uh, is a point I'm going to return to, uh, the, these coins were integrated in, in a scholarly context and they were, they were reflecting the broad interests in arts and humanities that the antiquarians are, of the time at least were supposed to have. And now, now that we move to this object, um, the, the Augsburg Art Cabinet, which is arguably one of the finest of its kind. And, and um, it, it, it is one of the, these uh, cabinets of curiosities or, uh, or an art cabinet, as we, as we prefer to call it. It was conceived by a certain Philipp Heinhofer, uh, who was a, well, uh, uh, an industrialist and a project leader. Uh, in, in Augsburg in southern Germany, uh, who had as a business idea to produce cabinets of this kind. Of course, he didn't do them himself, so he rather uh, coordinated uh, a number of um, various craftsmen and artists who, who, who did this, these uh, things. And this cabinet uh, was, was given as a gift to, to, the, to Gustavus Adolphus in 1632 during the Thirty Years' War when, when he came with the Swedish army to Augsburg. Uh, which was an ally to uh, to uh, uh, Sweden. Uh, af after Gustavus Adolphus's death, uh, the cabinet came to came to Sweden. It was so it was transported overland through through Germany on the roads of that age um, um, through through countries where there was war going on, uh, and the journey took a year or so. But after that time, the the cabinet finally arrived in Sweden and uh, could be reassembled again. It had been partly been been deconstructed for for the travels, um, and it, the, then it stood about at various cast, royal castles before um, uh, it was donated to Uppsala University in 1694. And uh, what the thing that makes this uh, art cabinet unique, even among Heinhofer's unique cabinets, is that uh, it's still in, in more or less perfect condition. And all of the more than 1,000 objects belonging to it were still in one place and are therefore for still in one place. And, and among those objects were a smaller number of Roman uh, coins, Monés et Medais, uh, uh, as, uh, as it's written in the inventories um, that were made in, the, in that age, um, some two or 300 of them. And that became the, uh, uh, the first um, coins uh, that would, would later become uh, Uppsala University coin cabinet. And um, yeah, uh, the, the, this uh, art cabinet is really a fa a, a quite a fascinating new museum collection, obviously. Um, there's, there's also uh, a quite re recent um, PhD dissertation on that, which was made by, by one of my colleagues, Egeg Sundin. Uh, and it's uh, it's uh, focusing on the various games uh, from that coin cabinet, uh, and there's also been, obviously been uh, lots of other things written about it as well. 
Uh, but but now let, let, let's uh, let's uh, focus, focus on on the coins um, from it, and we're going to return to, to the coin collections from from the Augsburg Art Cabinet. But now we uh, we should focus a bit on on the Queen Christina, uh, who was the daughter and successor of um, of Gustavus Adolphus. Um, she became uh, one of the earliest patrons of arts and culture in Sweden. And as she was only six years old when she formally ascended to the throne, uh, formal power was wielded by the Chancellor of State, Axel Uxenstierna, until 1644. And uh, he, he see a, a coin with a portrait of Uxenstierna. Uh, those are not struck in Sweden, but in Würzburg in Germany, uh, which was at the time under Swedish occupation. And they're they are extremely rare, um, and I'm, I'm not I'm not familiar with with any other coins struck with with the portraits of Uxenstierna. Although there are uh, a number of coins that, that were struck under under Uxenstierna, but not with his with his portrait, and that of course says quite a lot about about his powers in Sweden at the time. Um, then of course we we have coins struck for Christina herself. And as you see, you see an example to the right, to the upper right of one of the earlier coins from Christina's reign. Uh, they show a, a youthful portrait in a you know, in typical, in, in typical aristocratic fashion. And from this age, there's also a large part, uh, a large number of coins from the Swedish possessions. Um, and by that, we mean uh, the provinces around the Baltic that were part of Sweden at the time, and in, th in this case we have an example from present from Riga in present-day Latvia, and uh, some of the finest Swedish coins from the, uh, uh, the from the 17th century come from these provinces, um, and uh, one of our finest specimens here in here in Uppsala is this unique piece, um, uh, which is uh, ten ducats in gold. Featuring this uh, as uh, this uh, quite ma magnificent portrait of Christina, um, but uh, Christina's cultural interests were well known and wide ranging. For instance, uh, some of you, as some of you may know, the philosopher uh, Cartesius uh, René Descartes was invited to Stockholm uh, on the Queen's behalf, and apparently the same Sweden broke his health so that he died shortly thereafter. So that's. Uh, uh, as it were, Sweden's most famous contribution to the world, to the international philosophy. Uh, um, more, more interestingly, during her later re reign, classical imagery starts appearing on on Christina's coins, as you see on this uh, on this later coin. And Christina started refashioning herself as a Roman emperor, uh, and it can also be noted that in 1655, after she abdicated from the Swedish throne. She took, took the second name Alexandra. And coins and medals struck later in the reign are far, are far more classical in appearance than the earlier pieces, as you can see from the, the, this uh, very Rick Stoller, uh, struck in 1649. And um, it, uh, it might also be interesting to note uh, that Queen Christina was also one of the most notable coin collectors of the early 17th century. Her collections were based um, uh, on, war, on war booty. From from the Thirty Years' War, and but, but also on gifts, uh, but but uh, mainly actually from her on her own acquisitions, and in all the collections amount amounted to a total of fifteen thousand pieces, uh, uh, and was among the belongings that the Queen Christina took with her when she abdicated from the, the Swedish crown uh, and converted to Catholic Catholicism and left and uh, left to settle in Rome. Uh, which was, of course, seen as, as, a, as, a, as a huge scandal in, in Sweden at the time, and it's something we have been discussing ever since. And, and her, her collections were then also were described as the, some of them of the most no, notable of, of her time. And uh, during Christina's travels and stays in, and her stay in Rome, large parts of the collection were were, were dispersed, um, um, mainly because uh, Christina was 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 short on cash and. Uh, and, and sold parts of her collections at various places uh, during her travels. Um, and um, <clears throat> the remainder of the collection was, were accessible to scholars for study at her home at the Palazzo Riario alla Lugara. And the collections th thus served as a reference for most of the prominent numismatists of that period. 
And after her death, the collection amounted to over 6,000 pieces, which then passed into the possession of the Prince Livio Odescalchi, who was a relative of the reigning Pope Innocent IX. And thus it remained in Rome. And so, so her collections were, were, were therefore also some of the, of the first public collections, which I think is an interesting thing. Um, also, a number of medals and other works of art were commissioned by Christina and for Christina during her stay in Rome, both, both before the abdication and in Rome, such as the, the two medals you see below. And uh, thus, I think it is quite fitting that her, funer who, that her funer funerary monument in Rome, in, and in St. Peter's no less, is crowned by, by a, a giant medallion, as, as you see. So for us, the collections of Christina is interesting for a number of reasons. It's, uh, it was one of the most famous, famous collections of its age, and also one of the, of the, of the first uh, public collections that was accessible for study, and also one of the, of the first truly international collections, as it was formed in Sweden, then taken to Rome and to various parts uh, of it ended up in different places. So we see, so we see, see that coins crossed borders even in that age, and with the help of these coins, scholars in various con countries could establish contacts. And finally, as Christina sur surrounded herself with other works of art, including medals, her coin collections were an, an integral part in a, of a bigger cultural context. So let, let's move on to, to Swedish novelties from, from the mid 17th century. Uh, we have first the, 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 the copper plates. You, you see an example to the left. Um, those were minted from the mid 1640s to the 1670s in various de denominations. Uh, the largest copper plate was was a ten dollar piece, uh, which was only minted in, in 1644 and 1645. And the, the weight was just under 20 kilograms of, of copper, and those are extremely rare. And this piece, uh, the an eight dollar piece, an eight dollar plate. Uh, it weighs 16 kilos. Uh, the, the, there are more common. We, we have two of them. Um, an, inter an interesting detail is that it seems as if this uh, piece was originally a $10 piece. Uh, as you see, that it seems as, as if one of uh, the left side of it has been sawn off. And the reason for the introduction of these plates is not quite clear. Possibly the state wanted to promote the copper works uh, in Sweden by giving them the right to coining their own money. Uh, another suggestion is that Sweden wanted to export as much copper as possible, but still, but still wanted to keep the prices up. And in any case, uh, this uh, scheme did not work, as the plates were frequently sold for less, uh, for less than they were actually worth them, probably simply because people thought they were too heavy to, to go around with. And many of them were also cashed in uh, by, by a private bank, the Stockholm Banco in, St in Stockholm. Uh, which was uh, started by a certain Johan Palmstruck, a very industrious and creative person. And in exchange, Palmstruck issued some of the world's earliest banknotes. And Palmstruck was uh, very successful, and so successful that his bank started issuing banknotes they couldn't, they couldn't cover. Um, and uh, so when rumors, when rumors spread that this was happening and that uh, his banknotes could actually be worthless, uh, I mean, people went back to the bank and, and tried to cash uh, in the banknotes while the, there still was any copper in their vaults. Uh, ultimately, Pavel Struk was uh, thrown in prison and his bank was nationalized and it became one, uh, one of the world's first national banks, the, the bank of the, of the Swedish estates. So that's what they did to speculating banks in the, at least in Sweden, Sweden in the mid seventeenth century. Um, in the in the late seventeenth century, uh, a numismatic discipline starts developing in Sweden with the aid of, of study collections such as the one of Christina, and soon more systematic approaches were evident. Um, and the art cabinets, such as uh, the uh, Augsburg cabinet, soon became unfashionable. That's probably the reason why 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 the King Charles XI uh, saw fit to, to donate it to the university, as they didn't want to keep it anymore. And uh, new ways of looking at science that we would deem more modern developed. Uh, the mystic connections between things seen and things unseen that characterized the art cabinet gave way to a more modern systematic collections, um, and also more modern uh, num numismatic works. Um, and uh, the, the, this is one of the, one of the earliest, Elias Brenner's Thesaurus Sue Gotorum, 
um, is usually characterized as the first major work of note on Swedish coins and one of, one of the most important 17th century numismatic studies in Europe. And Brenner is therefore usually referred to in Sweden as the father of Swedish numismatics. Uh, then, then on to another another famous Swedish king, um, Charles the Twelfth, uh, used to be he, who used to be the hero, the most heroic king in nationalistic Swedish historiography. Um, these days, of course, his legacy is a far more complex one. Um, Charles the Twelfth's uh, military military victories during the the Great Nordic War in, in the late in the during the last years of the. 17th century and in the first decades of the 18th century were are, are no longer so appreciated as they used to be um, in, in the late 19th century, for instance. Um, for one thing, for one thing or, or because we tend not to like wars that much these days, uh, also because these wars ultimately led to the ruin of Sweden after the Great Nordic War. On the other hand, uh, uh, the openness of King Charles XII uh, towards international influences are, are, are quite appreciated. Um, from our perspective, the, the portraits of, of Charles on coins are of a very high quality, as, uh, as you can see on the, uh, the Riksdaler to the upper right. Also, there's a large number of medals from the Great Nordic War, mainly, of course, focusing on the heroic efforts of the warrior king, as, you, as the one you see um, below to the right, um, um, and, and the, where, where of course all the uh, the, the um, battles of the king are are described um, as the labors of Hercules, uh, as, as, you, as you see here, for instance, where we see Her, uh, um, Hercules um, symbolizing the king, obviously uh, fighting against the Hydra, um, symbolizing the kings of Denmark, Poland, Poland, and Russia. But uh, there's, there's, there's also lots of different perspectives from, from the Great Nordic War. Um, so so it, it's also quite fun, it's always quite fun to uh, compare um, the, the Swedish medals with uh, the contemporary medals struck in Denmark and in Russia. And, uh, this, and this, um, it's, it's especially the, the, the Danish medal from the Great Nordic War are, are, are great favorites of mine. I, I, I should confess that. Uh, um, I, I, I think the medals from Denmark stand out for being both very well made and, quite, and actually quite funny. Uh, the medal to the left is one, of, is one of the best and one of the most famous ones. The motif uh, uh, shows the, the, da the Danish elephant, the Danish kings, have associate, apparently associated themselves with elephants since the late Middle Ages. I had to Google that actually. Um, and he, he sees, so here you see the Danish elephant coming with a torch, coming uh, coming towards a barrel where where an ibex, um, as I believe they're called, is hiding. And this is a reference to the Swedish field marshal Magnus Stianbock. And Stianbock is Steinbock. It's the same word, same word as an ibex. Who, after devastating the North German city of Altona in, in 1713, um, was then laid under siege in Tönning, a, a, a city, city in southern Denmark, where he ultimately surrendered to, to the Danish forces. And, and he, on, the, on this medal, you, you, you can actually see the, the uh, remains of the city of Altona in the background. And uh, yeah, they, they, they see the, the, the Field Marshal Stianbock in, in his barrel. Uh, you know, just, just w w w waiting for, for, for the Danish element to, elephant to uh, set the fire underneath him. And to the right is, is Russian Russian medal uh, from from uh, Peter the Great commemorating the capture of Narva in in seventeen o four, which is in a style which is quite typical of the Russian medals of that age. Um, you know, with, with all these bombs fly, flying. Like like fireworks and um, yeah, style is st stiffer, but uh, but um, sort of cinematic in its own way, and and of course um, the the Russian capture of Narva was uh, especially embarrassing for the Swedish forces as uh, uh, the first battle of the, of Narva in the in, in the year 1700, 1700 uh, was one of the major Swedish victories and one of the uh, victories that sort of made the legend of the Charles XII and his, his invisibility, invincibility, I should say. Um, 
let's move on to, to the, in, in, into the 18th century. And um, uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly about this slide and the, and the next one, uh, because I see the time, that the time is flying, as it usually does when, when you're having fun. And of course, uh, uh, tourism and the, the grand tour travels is, is shape, shaping um, uh, culture, culture through, throughout Europe uh, in the 18th century, not, not, uh, not least Sweden. And it's one of the reasons that, that people uh, gather coin collections because the coins were handy souvenirs that, that you would get when you came to Italy, for instance. Um, you know, coins were coins were were also things that that uh, would inter that would uh, lead to social interactions. Um, you 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 could go to coin auctions or coin dealers uh, and and meet meet people and uh, and acquire new contacts. So when you came for in, to Rome, for instance, um, uh, and a, a colleague of mine, uh, Ulf Hansson, who is now the director of the Swedish Institute in Rome, has uh, done a lot of research on on that and especially on, of on the, this uh, curious person, Philip von Stosch, whom you, whom you see on one of these illustrations. Um, uh, very curious and, and exciting person in, in his own right. Um, and um, the, the 18th century is also the, the, the age when, when, when we see the, the birth of the scientific collection. Uh, the greatest name in that age uh, in Uppsala and in Sweden is, of course, going to be Carl Linnaeus, um, the, um, the founder of, the, of modern botany, uh, as, as it were, and of, of course, the major superstar of Uppsala University in, in, in that age, um, the, and the age of Linnaeus and, and his disciples and of their travels uh, is really a key thing in the history of, of Uppsala University in that age. And um, they, they collected objects and all, they ordered the world around them according to new rules. And so they yeah, and their colleagues. Uh, uh, and their colleagues in other countries created huge collections of various types of animals, plants, um, and minerals, etc. And here's an example of, of this uh, from the New, New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, which I always show because I, I, I think it's both both cute, cute and a bit macabre. And, and then now back uh, after this little detour to the birth of, of the systematic coin collection in Uppsala. And here we, ha we have this, this person called the Idrich Eren Preuss, who sold his collection of um, some 2,700 coins and medals to Uppsala University in 1750 at a, at a very cheap price. And, uh, curiously enough, he became the vice chancellor of the university in the following following year. So there might be a connection between those, those two events. And, and about the same time, uh, Queen uh, Louise Ulrika, who was the, the major benefactor of the arts and culture in uh, Sweden, also donated her collection of uh, some uh, 1,670 Roman coins to the university. And those ac acquisitions marked the founding of a much more modern coin collection. And a number of similar donations were to follow in the in the 18th century. And personally, personally, I think that um, our, our collection of Roman Republican coins uh, is uh, the finest part of our, of our collection because we have a, a number of, of of extremely high fine pieces, not not uncommon types, but a very very fine pieces that are, uh, that must be from the collections of uh, Luis Ulrika or from uh, or from uh, another uh, old collection. And uh, here you see, the, you see the, the cabinet made, made for for Eden Preuss's collections, and um, for, for a long time the the collections of of Uppsala University were kept in this cabinet. Uh, when the when the collection outgrew the cabinet, similar similar ones were constructed, and so those um, mark the founding of a more of a much more modern coin collection. And uh, and you know, they they can be seen as a fine example of the 18th century systematics, um, uh, where where you create your own order, just like in the cabinet of curiosities. Um, um, you you, can, you you would put the Swedish coins to one side. After them, you you can arrange your various coins from various European states, um, uh, your Roman coins, uh, and and so forth. Um, so. Um, ne next, we we come to uh, to Gustav the Third, the, the theater king, 
uh, which is uh, the next um, or um, possibly the, the last Swedish king that may be of some of some more international interest. Um, in the, he was the king of Sweden in the last decades of the 18th century, uh, which was um, a golden age for Swedish culture, as, as a king was an important patron of arts, and he was widely called the theater king because he was especially interested in, in theater. He was, however, also an autocrat who marginalized the powers of both the aristocracy and the other estates of Sweden. And so, and finally, he was shot at a masquerade and died two weeks later from, from his wounds, which was an, an event which inspired Giuseppe Verdi later to write his opera Gustavo Terzo, which would later become uh, the opera Un Ballo di Maschera, which is still sometimes, sometimes, sometimes performed. Uh, what, what interests us here today uh, is uh, the, wide, the wide range of medals from the age of, of Gust Gustav III, because like Louis XIV earlier, uh, Gustav had ambitious plans and medals were used consistently uh, th during his reign to promote uh, the, his royal policies. And Gustav III even conceived a, a medallic history, uh, which ultimately would comprise engravings of, of um, as of close to 100, 100 medals, and some of the, those medals were, were actually never never actually executed. Uh, the plates um, uh, in this medall medallic history, almost all the plates for these, um, I think it was 99 medals, were, were done. Uh, but after a while, it, 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 apparently, it, it, it was seen as more, imp more interesting to actually just do the plates than, 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 than doing the actual medals, because doing the, because in producing the actual medals was uh, expensive and just doing just doing the plates was much much cheaper um, but not even all the plates were done so but, but we have the list of all the topics of these medals and what would become medals uh, one of the characteristic medals from this series is the one to the uh, to the right on the top uh, which commemorates the the coup d'etat of uh, 1772 whereby Gustav III effectively became an autocrat. Uh, and on this medal, as you see, uh, the, the king it is refashioned as the ancient hero Padasus, uh, his, his saving, uh, who's saving Andromeda, who, who's rep representing the, the Swedish state from the threat of, of the, the sea monster, uh, which symbolizes the estates of Sweden. And of course, the assassination uh, of, of Gustav was also commemorated with, with medals, um, uh, such as this one, which uh, is, was engraved by, by Küchler in, in, in England, uh, where you actually see uh, the, the, the actual murder of King Gustav uh, uh, staged as a, as, a, as a theatrical scene in the middle of this altar, which, which I think is a, is a bit of an irony there. And, and according to a later Swedish reference work, uh, uh, this uh, uh, this med medal is overloaded and tasteless. And so um, we now come to two topics that I'm, I'm not. I, I think I'm not going to say so much about. Uh, um, in the in the 19th century, there's a, there's a lot of school collections. Uh, that, that's a very typical uh, development uh, in, in Sweden. There's lots of um, primary schools and uh, gymnasium schools uh, uh, where the schoolmasters um, uh, um, create their own coin collections, um, basically for teaching, obviously. Uh, but but again, it seems as if uh, these coin collections are also ser serving social purposes. Uh, um, it, and then people find it attractive to donate coins to these collections because uh, it uh, gives them an opportunity to interact with other peoples in in their local communities. Um, uh, and 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 um, that's that's a topic of which hasn't really been studied. Uh, there's been a few studies on on these school collections, um, uh, and such as this one, which which is uh, a, a collection in in a small diocese, a city called Strenes, which is um, yeah. Uh, close to Stockholm on the southern side of La Lake Mallorca. Um, well, there's a um, few numismatic personalities from the 19th century Swedish numismatics. Um, 
uh, Johan Soto Pontén, whom you see to the left. Uh, he, he was the schoolmaster who created the collection of, of Strengnäs. Um, uh, so he's uh, not he's not really a famous person himself, or rather he's quite forgotten, but he's, uh, he's, uh, he is uh, uh, the re representative of, uh, uh, of a generation of schoolmasters who created a lot of, 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 of collections and um, uh, did a lot of ground of uh, footwork in on, on the numismatic scene in Sweden in the 19th century. August Wilhelm Kernstedt and Bror Emil Hildebrandt are far more um, well known, at least in Sweden, and much more important. Uh, Kernstedt was um, Kernstedt in the middle uh, was one of the key figures in 19th century numismatics in Sweden. An important collector and, and scholar, uh, he wrote several numismatic works and articles. And, um, and it was also one of the founders of the Swedish Numismatic Association, which was formed in 1873. And it was also its first chairman. Bror Emil Hildebrand to the right is uh, probably the most important figure in Swedish numismatics in the 19th century. And he was the, uh, cus the custodian of ancient monuments and secretary of the Royal Swedish Academy of Letters from 1837 to 1879, that is more than 40 years. And he was also the founder of the Swedish, His Swedish History Museum in 1866. So he is really, really, in many respects, the founder of Swedish museum culture uh, in, in the mid 19th century. Um, let's turn to two important engravers. Mm, I think it deserves mentioning. The first one deserving mentioning is Leah Alborn, whom you see to the left, uh, an important and unfair and um, rather overlooked person in Swedish art history. Uh, she was an engraver, uh, a mem member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Arts. She was also apparently the first woman in Swedish state service and the world's only fema female royal engraver of coins and medals. And she engraved the dice of all the Swedish coins in the second half of the 19th century, and also most medals in that age. In, and she did in total a little less than 400 items, um, which is an incredible production. She also engraved coins and dice for Norway and Finland. And she, she was also commissioned by, by the, American, the American Numismatic Society to create a, the, a medal depicting George Washington for the centennial in 1883. And uh, you see that one to the left. Uh, that's uh, that's sadly not one of our pieces. Mm. Uh, also, I think this earlier reverse uh, that you see to the right uh, for a medal commissioned for the retirement of a certain Nils Eriksson, uh, who, who was a ra railway director, is uh, quite characteristic for uh, Alborn's style and for the contrasts in 19th century medallic art between classical forms and modern content. Um, so you see the, the clash between uh, classical imagery and modern industry, or rather you see them both in, in sweet harmony, wh whichever you will. Uh, and to, to the right, you have Erik Lindberg, um, who, who, is, uh, who is famous, if for no other reason, so because he was responsible for the medals still awarded for the world's most fam famous prize, I suppose, even if the medals are, themselves are far less known. And they're actually awarded this week, this very weekend, the Nobel Prize medals. And these these medals were also also quite an early work of Lindberg. He was only twenty eight when he when he did them. And uh, you, you see, see the obverse with the with the portrait of, of Nobel to the left, um, and the reverse to the right depicts um, uh, one a Nobel Prize medal we, we actually do do not have. We have two from two Swedish Nobel laureates. Uh, uh, this is the one, uh, as, as you may see, if you if you can read the inscription awarded to Bob Dylan in 2016. And I think that reverse of the prize awarded awarded in literature is rather interesting, because at least in Sweden, um, the fact that the prize was awarded to a musician received some criticism. And apparently no one had noticed that the reverse of the, the medal uh, shows a muse playing the lyre and a young man listening intently. Uh, which I think is a motive which was quite fitting in this case. Uh, so fast forward to our own time just to conclude, and, and this is where we are now. Uh, obviously, th this is this is a, thank God it's not our collection. Uh, I took this just to illustrate uh, what I think um, most uh, numismatic collections look like these days. And, uh, there's a number of huge coin collections. Uh, we have uh, 
we have around 40,000 objects uh, um, and we, we have one of the smaller collections. The collections of the Royal Coin Cabinet in Stockholm has over, over 500,000 objects. And of course, there's even bigger collections abroad. Uh, but um, these collections, I would argue, are still essentially the same kind of collections as during the, um, during the uh, 17th century, only, only they're much, more, much bigger. Coins have been locked in vaults, and uh, they have been compar comparatively in inaccessible until the last um, 10 years. And now, as we all know, this has changed with the advent of digital technology. Nowadays, we're digitizing co collections, we're making them available online. Uh, and in a, and in a, in a database, of course, a coin can be connected to just about anything. Works of art, sculptures, archives, photos, and so forth. And in this way, we are, in a sense, returning to the, the, to the ideas behind the collections of curiosities, as we are enabling scholars and interested viewers to connect our collections um, with any amount of other objects they can find online. And um, yeah, this is just a few slides to, to show what, what we're doing in Uppsala. Um, one problem we challenge today, except for the size of the collections, is all data. Um, as we know, it's not uncommon that information about coins can be more than 100 years old and creating new uh, information, that which we usually call metadata, that takes a lot of time. Um, but um, uh, we have been doing, doing this for, for quite some time and we have found out that um, uh, it's really, it's, uh, really uh, necessary to, to really consider what uh, kind of data you really, really need and what's really, really necessary. Um, and uh, it, it turns out that there's uh, actually not that much data which is needed to be able to, to make things available online in, uh, in, in a meaningful way. We really only need the weights, the dimensions of the coin and, and not least very good images. Um, and if uh, such data is provided, uh, scholars who want to study our collections have really have all they need. Uh, so the first lesson we, we have learned is that we need is that you need to decide which data is really necessary and how you, you want to define it. So yeah, he, 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 here's an example of what it looks like now in our collections. And uh, yeah, this is the uh, an example of the, the digital documentation we're doing of our of our pieces. Uh, and, and especially the photography, which we have, which we, we have discovered is by far the most important thing we're doing. And yeah, this, and this is where we are putting our objects now. And um, so just to conclude the, the, this talk um, with, a, with a final re reflection then, um, digital, digital collections are now developing everywhere. Uh, we, are, we are putting our collections in this uh, the database, called, database called the Alvin. And um, mind you, all, all, all the coins I've been showing here that are from our collections, a few of them aren't, but the, the, the coins from our collections can all be found in this Alvin uh, database. Uh, and um, all, all our coin images that we have put out there uh, should should be good enough for printing, and they're all open access, so that may, may be worth knowing. And and if if you're looking for something, uh, but you can't find it from our collections, that you can, you for some reason you you can't find the images in Alvin, just write to me, and I can provide them, provide you with a bit with the images. But anyway, as I said, digital collections are now de developing everywhere, uh, which is not least due to the pioneering work by the colleagues at the ANS. And so you, you've really done, done, done a fantastic job there with all the databases you've been building. Uh, but the, digit the digital world provides us with a range of possibilities we have not yet started exploring, I think. Heinhofer's art cabinet for, from Augsburg contained and connected objects representing the whole of the known world. So can we now do something similar in the, in the virtual world? I think it's time that we start thinking about how to make our data sets uh, and our, our coins interact with all the other digital data out there. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'm just going to stop your screen share for a second. Yeah, I can, I can, I can do that, yeah, thank you. <laughs> do we have any questions? Dr. Evelyn, thank you so much for that. I do have a question. Um, yeah. It kind of ties two sections of your presentation together. You ended with uh, data 
Uh, yeah. And in the middle, you had the you know 17th and 18th century collect, uh, collectors. And I was wondering if you can kind of mash them together. And do you have the data that these earlier numismatists were collecting? Uh, you know, any any logs or catalogs or anything that they were doing? And if so, how detailed were they getting? Were they were they noting rarity or anything like that, or were they just talking about you know this one this coin comes from Geneva, so I'm going to collect it, sort of thing? Um, Yes, we have a we have a number of early of we're actually quite well provided with early, with earlier inventories um, uh, from Uppsala University coin cabinet, and they can also be found online in in the in the same database. Um, um, uh, the problem is we we can't really connect uh, the the coins listed in those inventories with the actual coins in our collections uh, because there everything has just been mixed together um which was which is because when the coins were collected the the proveniences were not seen as very interesting uh, so, so so we can't really tie the coin the coins um, from our collections to the old donations um, so so that's one thing uh, the other thing is that uh, most most of these um, uh, uh, inventories we have and most of these lists of coins we have are are quite are quite general. Um, I don't think there's things such as rarities are are, are ever ever recorded. Excellent, thank you. Mm. Yeah, we we have we, we ha have a question here from 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 Mr. Shear, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I was just going to type it in the chat. Do we know yeah. the artist of the first Gustav Vasa medal? Um, I think we, I, I think, I think we do. I, 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 the name doesn't, doesn't come, come to mind now. I, if, if uh, uh, you, you would like to know it, I, I, you can just write to me and uh, I can provide you with the name if I, if I have it later. Okay, so rather high quality. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a very very high quality piece. So so probably uh, the, the the medalist was 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 not a local one, but so but, uh, I'd say prob probably a, a North German medalist, um, because they were quite quite active in Sweden in, in that age. Yeah. Do do we have your your address to to communicate? Do you... uh, yeah, I can I can put it out in the, I can put it out in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just write it here. And we do have a, a question in the chat. Are there resources to learn about coins that were made in Sweden before it was a nation as such, i.e. Celtic and medieval times? Oh, yes. Um, we we uh, ha have one publication of uh, uh, the, uh, of Swedish uh, Viking Age and medieval coins uh, from our collections, uh, uh, which all which also uh, which also provides an introduction to um, the, n n to the coin collection to the coin collections in Uppsala, uh, and it's also it's also quite it's also a, a comprehensible uh, list of Swedish med med medieval coinage, uh, um, and there's so there's also. A, a, a number of of other general reference works on on the topic of of of, of Swedish medieval coinage. Thank you. <laughs> and yes, um, it, it was it was a develop. It, I've been sitting here on my on my pillar in Delphi since since COVID nineteen began. <laughs> Well, do you have any other questions? All right, I guess we'll say one more thank you. Um, I, I very much enjoy that. I always think the ANS has a long history and then you guys come over from Europe and <laughs> let us know what an actual long history is. Thank you for um, watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication and events, you can support the society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.